and slightly nervous hope is that after I show you the video and tell you the story of the video, I'm going to attempt very tentatively to consider how our concerns are put in their place and are on a different scale from human rights concerns. Fair use is a lot different than fair treatment and being in prison, giving birth in prison. Uh, we are an extremely important um, human and social issue that we represent here. These are more extreme and even more ambitious and even more possibly risky. I would like to make a connection. I would like to try to make some tentative connection between the right to fair use of literary material like poetry and the right to human freedoms and particularly the right to freedom of expression and I do want to do it quite intimately. Um, can we go to the beginning of this disc? I think we're a little bit ways into it with that. The favorite poem project consisted of me inviting Americans to write a few sentences it was not a play. It was to write a few sentences uh, about a poem that they liked. If we can go right to the beginning of the video. My advertising budget is about $5. <laughs> we got tens of thousands of letters and emails. And uh, the project produced a couple of books. The book, American's Favorite Poems, with an apostrophe after the S, is now in its 17th or 18th printing. W. W. Norton has done very well with that book. The other book, Invitation of Poetry, comes with the DVD that has these uh, segments on it. I also urge you to go to favoritepoem.org, poem, not poet, and sing it, favoritepoem.org, and you'll see uh, a construction worker reading a Walt Whitman poem and talking about what, why he likes that Whitman poem. You'll see a Cambodian-American uh, immigrant teenager in San Jose with a kind of a valley girl way of speaking, talk about her family's horrendous experiences in Cambodia, and then she reads a Langston Hughes poem and talks about the Langston Hughes poem. You'll see a Jamaican immigrant talk about uh, a Sylvia Plath poem, what it means to him. Uh, these segments are about five minutes long. The video I'm about to show you was suppressed for about 10 years. A year ago, thanks to Jennifer Urban, Sherman C's organization, the Samuelson Center at Old Paul Law School in California, uh, the video is no longer suppressed. It's now where it belongs on the other ones on the website. Uh, so in this case, the lawyers are heroes. I got pro bono representation from the favorite poem project from Jennifer Urban, and uh, I've also got a free education in matters of uh, copyright and fair use. So rather than tell you the story, that's the background of the story, I think the next thing I'd like to do is if we can just bring the lights down. Uh, the young man is named Pod Helms. The poem is by County Cullen. And I'll show you the video, and then I'll tell you why the video could not be seen for 10 or 11 years. Yet do I marvel by County Cub. I doubt not God is good, well-meaning, kind. And if he soup the quibble, could tell why the little buried mole continues to why flesh that nerves him must someday die. Make plain the reason toward the tactics is baited by the pickled fruit. Declare it merely through caprice to insistence to struggle of the never-ending state. Inscrutable his ways are and immune to catechism by a mind too strong with petty cares to slightly understand what awful brain compels his awful hand. Yet do I marvel at this curious thing to make a court black and live insane. My name is Todd Holmes. I don't have anything else to, to hand out. I don't have any labels to give to anybody. You've got my name, so you know how to call me if you see me in the street. And that's about it.
I am 19 years old. I don't do much of anything for a living, really. My parents still take care of me. I guess I'm a student. I spend most of my time reading, but my passion is writing. Sometimes I sit down in front of my writing pad and I don't feel like I'm qualified to write because I haven't read enough, so I'll put the pad down and read the book. But I love to write. I hope that one day I can be as eloquent as County Cullen. When I first read Hit Do I Marvel, um, I didn't know what it meant. Uh, I had to take the, the piece of paper home that it was written on and, and look up all of the allusions to uh, ancient mythology and that kind of thing and figure out what it meant. Um, so in the beginning, it was just kind of me trying to figure out a poem. I wasn't really good at deciphering poetry. Um, after I understood everything that was being said in the poem, um, I, it was almost epiphanous. I knew what County Cullen was talking about, how he felt so isolated. I've been called nigger, I've been called jungle bunny, I've been called coon. Uh, before I even got into high school, I had heard all these names. So there was that. After I, after I thought I had explored the uh, whole black thing all the way, um, I, I knew that I was isolated in other ways. I've always known um, the fact that I'm gay doesn't help. Um, when I was younger, someone told me I had a really high IQ and that didn't help either. Um, I always kind of felt like I was put aside. I don't know if it was so much that I was ostracized by anyone, but I think because of the knowledge of who I was, black, gay, whatever, I kind of pulled myself out. Religion has an incredible significance in my life, mostly because of my family. I believed that God was on my side, that God was inside of me and totally accessible to me. I prayed every night, I prayed at every meal, I wept in church, and that was how I felt all throughout my childhood. God was personal to me. I felt a change in my relationship with God, probably, I'd say when I was going into the eighth grade. I had a lot of time to think about God and think about, was he really with me during those times when I was being teased and called names? Um, and God didn't seem quite so personal anymore. There were discussions between me, my mother, and my grandmother about my religion, about my sexuality. They very firmly believe that being gay is an unhealthy thing and that I shouldn't be gay. I felt like Cullen had touched on all the things that I wanted to say, all the things that I was feeling and couldn't express as eloquently as he. I realized that he was saying everything that I wanted to say, that I wanted to say to my mother, that I wanted to say to the people in all of my classes in high school um, about how hard it was to be a certain way and not be able to talk to people about it. I doubt my God is good, well meaning, kind. And if he stooped to quibble, could tell why the little buried mole continues blind, why in flesh that mirrors him must someday die. Make plain the reason torture tantalus is baited by the fickle fruit. Declare it merely for caprice to Sisyphus who struggle of a never ending stare. Inscrutable his ways are, and immune to catechism by a mind too strong with petty cares to slightly understand what awful brain compels his awful hand. Yet do I marvel at this curious thing to make a point black and then insane. Uh, I'll apologize for the uh, quality, the synchronization of the sound of the video. My executive producer, Juanita Anderson, who's also the director of this video, made very high quality uh, media. This is partly because I made the DVD myself the other day, and uh, if you go to the website, you'll see the quality of these things. I feel I owe it to Juanita to say that. The book, American's Favorite Poems, published in, what would it be, 1999 or 2000, each poem, and by the way, it's still selling, each poem in that book is accompanied by one, two, three, four quotations from letters people wrote about those poems. 
and I excluded from the videos and from the letters no poets, no professors of poetry, no literary critics. It's all, quote, ordinary, end quote, people. And in that book, we print the County Cullen poem. We got permission from the Ida Cullen estate, represented by Thompson and Thompson. We found them by looking at other anthologies to record the poem. And uh, they gave us a price, I think it was like $250 or something. We paid it, and we had the form. And in the book, where the poem is printed, we quote Todd Helms. And I believe it's just one sentence. Todd Helms says, I am black and gay, and County Cullen was black and gay. We neglected, when we asked for permission for the County Cullen poem, we neglected to ask for permission for other media, just ask permission for the book. As a result, it was necessary when we made these videos, and they are cool, I, I really encourage you to go to favoritepoem.org or to get invitation to poetry. Uh, in most cases, we pay a little bit more or nothing more and the publisher filled out the form for the media. Thompson and Thompson didn't answer us, and then finally, we got back a letter from Patricia Thompson of Thompson and Thompson saying, this is anathema. To say that County Cullen is gay, if we had known what that man was going to say in that book of yours, we never would have given permission. So in short, I had documentary evidence that the reason that permission was denied to use the video was it was explicitly homophobic. There's a biography of County Cullen that's about to be uh, appeared by Charles Molesworth. I've read some of it. In fact, I helped Charles Molesworth with some of his permission problems in relation to this. Um, County Cullen, is, is, I think it remains the most elaborate and famous marriage in the history of Harlem. It's like a royal marriage. He married W.E.B. Du Bois' daughter. And it's also famous that that marriage ended within months. And uh, there's a man with whom County Cullen had a very long relationship. And interestingly, late in his life, he married Ida Cullen. All I could do was keep writing letters to Patricia Thompson. I checked with Juanita, the producer, to get permission. I said, look, we've sent you this video. Let me send it to you again. Anything you don't like in the video, which doesn't say anything about County Cullen's sexuality, we'll take out, we'll edit it. And imagine my having to hear from this young guy, Todd Helms. In the video, he says, I felt I was always pushed aside. I was always pushed aside. And he writes to me and he says, I've seen these videos on the web in the book. I know they shot mine. I have to write him a letter saying, we can't use yours. I even had a phone conversation with Patricia Thompson at one point, where I tried my best. And uh, she said, to my client, this is like a holocaust. And then it was silence for many, many years. Then the Poetry Foundation asked me to serve on a task force of uh, 10 people who were to meet and talk about intellectual property issues and fair use of poetry. And I said, I would do that on one condition. Uh, I, I really don't like being on committees. I don't like task forces. I hate meetings. But I will do this if the first thing we do is watch this video. Everybody in that task force on intellectual property would begin by seeing this video. That turns out to be one of the better ideas I ever had. <laughs> because Jennifer Urban, the uh, attorney who is the director of the uh, children's organization, the Samuelson Center, uh, as some people are about the video, Jennifer was moved, I think, to tears. And uh, she told me, I'm going to give you uh, pro bono representation for the favorite poem project. And we will go into this case. And uh, Parakur Doglu and John Myers, two students at Paul at the time, did a lot of research. 
I learned that in each of the district courts that might be involved, Washington, D.C., where the uh, David Paul Project originated, New York, where Patricia Thompson was, uh, I'm in Boston, I forget what the different courts were. Each court had very, very different attitudes and definitions of fair use. I learned what the three or four different factors in fair use are, and they're way different by different courts. I learned that the fact that the young man reads the poem twice, once at the beginning and once at the end, might help us or might hurt us, depending upon what legal interpretation <laughs> would take place. So it became quite clear to me that as to fair use, nobody knows what it means. It's an extremely ambiguous, devolving and evolving concept. I also learned that the copyright was not the property of Ida Collins' estate. Copyright is the property of an organization called the Amistad Center uh, in uh, uh, Tulane University in New Orleans. And uh, my heart leapt up when I learned that the Amistad Center owned the copyright because I've worked, I've, I've earned my bread as a teacher all my life. I've been around universities a lot. And I know many scuzzy things about universities. <laughs> but I also know how to talk to people at universities. And I know there are certain principles. And one of them is that people have a right to information and to know things and that were on the side of scholarship. And indeed, the Amistad's mission was to encourage scholarship. And let me add at this point that my main concern was not for Todd Helms. My main concern was not for the favorite poem project. My concern in this is for County Cullen, the artist. County Cullen wrote this poem, and in the anthology and in these videos, as I said to Ms. Thompson, I want to put County Cullen's poem into a category with poems by William Shakespeare, Emily Dickinson, William Butler Yeats, Walt Whitman, County Cullen's poem deserves to be read and heard. The Amistad Center, I anticipated, would be my friend, and in a sense, they were. I spoke to people there, and they said, uh, well, we are here to encourage scholarship and knowledge, and uh, we, will, uh, we will give you permission to do this. However, in the will, and by the way, I learned from, uh, again, Jennifer Urban's law students, I learned that the very small amounts of money went not to the Amistad Center, but to a young woman who was a grandniece of Ida Cullen, the late wife, and who, as far as anyone could determine, had no interest in poetry, fair use, or even much in these small checks. She was the heir of the money, such as it was. People at the Amistad Center, I said, well, could you please just send me in writing that I have permission? Then they said, oh, but the fee must be sent, in the terms of the will, the fee must be sent, and after what I had taken to be a law firm all this time, turns out to have been an accounting firm. The fee must be set by Thompson and Thompson. And you must get a fee that you have paid to Thompson and Thompson. Not to be confused with the Tintin characters. <laughs> well, we, we can't give you permission until that happens. And Thompson and Thompson had successfully stonewalled me for many years just by not answering letters and emails. So this was potentially an impasse. And again, my pro bono attorneys heroically laid out to me everything that might happen. We had a discussion. And uh, my decision, with a lot of counsel information from them, was that we should write a letter to Thompson and Thompson saying, we will be very glad to pay a reasonable fee as soon as you send it to us. Um, in the meantime, this video is going to be posted at www.favoritepalm.org. 
I'd already sent the Amistad Center the book with the DVD in it, and they loved it. I mean, they were very, very nice about it, but they were not ultimately at all helpful. <laughs> One more barrier remained, and again, a lawyer is the hero. The website, favoritepoem.org, is sponsored by my university, Boston University. And Boston University, you will not be surprised to know, has deeper pockets than I do. So it was necessary for BU to agree. And I arranged a conference call with Jennifer Urban and the uh, BU attorney, Lawrence Ellswick, whom I knew a bit. And uh, we sent we sent all the documents and documentation to Lawrence in the uh, counsel's office at Boston University. And uh, I, I wish I had written it down so I could quote him uh, exactly. He said, I've looked at all the documents. I've examined all of this. He said, if they want to contest this, I'm a litigator. Let me at it. <laughs> and uh, he sent a letter on DU letterhead. Uh, to uh, Thompson and Thompson saying, having permission from the uh, Amistad Center, uh, we're not going to post this video and we'll be glad to pay any reasonable fee and send you some as a bill for it. That is now over a year ago. We haven't heard from them, but many people have seen the video since then. So this was ultimately a happy outcome in a process that was quite painful uh, and uh, immensely frustrating and I identify with County Cullen. I don't want my work to be unavailable. After I die, if anything I wrote or anything I edited makes a little money and my children want to get it, good. I'm glad for them to have it. As to my grandkids, I love them. You'll be surprised to hear they're quite cute. <laughs> but let them write their own poems. <laughs> <laughs> they can take care of themselves. And uh, I would be glad to have boilerplate go out to all writers that says, X number of years after my death, I would say about writers 20, I want all my works, all my copyrights to be in public domain. Because I think that is what all artists Now I'll try to uh, extend, extend this to the more dire and extreme area of human rights. And Kale saying a little about the nature of poetry as reflected in these videos. In my understanding of the art of poetry, it is a vocal art, but not a performative art. This distinction at first may seem pedantic or obscure. It is a vocal art, but not necessarily a performative art. I'll give you two kinds of examples. First example, theoretically, is to do with the word we've used a lot today, is germane to the subject, medium, which is the plural of medium. Something that is a medium or is medium is in between. It's neither tall nor short, it's medium. Neither hot nor cold, it's medium. The news media, the medium of television, the medium of the web, the medium of print, the medium of newspapers, the medium of magazines, they come between the event and we who perceive the event through them. The artist's medium comes in between the artist's ideas and feelings than the medium of paint, of, uh, for the architect of plaster and wood and steel, the medium of iron, whatever the medium is, it's between the artistic conception of feeling and the one who perceives the work of art. The spirit medium is between the other world and this world. The medium for a poem again, in this conception, is one human body, the column of air in that human body, not necessarily the artist's body. I once said in an essay that poetry is perhaps the most 
bodily of all the arts. And my friend said, you know, Robert, that part where you say it's the most bodily of all the arts. Yes. Dancing. Quite <laughs> <laughs> bodily. <laughs> yes and no. In dance as a high art, it's an expert, trained body. I submit to you that in poetry, the medium is the audience's body. It's that infinite and that much on a human scale. The medium is not Kathy Cullen reading his poem. It's not an actor, Sir John Gielgud reading Shakespeare with the beautiful voice. It's not the poet with a nice personality selling the poem. It's anyone at all, like Kathy Cullen and like the other videos, anyone at all saying the poem. I'll now say a two line poem to you. I guess that it's important to footnote it, perhaps. I don't really think it is, but leaky is the water of forgetfulness. Uh, it's combined, actually, lethal combines a Greek word and a, a Latin word which are unrelated. One that means death as a lethal, one that means forgetting. Anyway, the river of lethe is the river of forgetfulness. In the underworld, across lethe, you forget. poem is two lines long. It's by Walter Savage Landor, who died in 1865 after a long life. On love, on grief, on every human thing, time sprinkles me his water with his queen. On love, on grief, on every human thing, time sprinkles me his water with his queen. Lander was an upper class Englishman who was one of the leading classes. He was the leading neo Latin poet of his day, among other things. I am not an upper class Englishman. I don't know Latin. There are a lot of ways in which I'm not like Lander. But my body was his instrument. Three times at the beginning of that poem, I put my upper teeth on my lower lip. I love. On grief, on every human thing. Three times at the end of the poem, I purse my lips. Time sprinkles me his water with his wing. Little bones in your ear, the breath, the special organ humans have for this purpose. The medium was my breath coming through my voice box. I was Landor's instrument. This means that like a piece of music, a poem is something that happens. It happens in time. And indeed, it happens, it takes place every time someone says it. And each time I say it, I feel a little different. Todd Helen says the Cullen poem at the beginning, he says the beginning at the end. Each of us will hear it differently when he says it, and he feels differently each time. So the poem is perhaps uniquely intimate as a work of art, and it is inherently and by the nature of the medium on a human scale. It is intimate, it is on a human scale, and it uses this peculiar system of brunts that the primate has evolved. If you were on another planet, you would be astonished to hear that Yes, there is, a, there is an animal on that planet that through uh, the artifice of uh, ingestion, it emits this series of blunts that can give very sophisticated information. Go to the hardware store, not Burroughs's, pound leads, and get me a pound of uh, galvanized number six roofing nails. That's not the kind of Rembrandt I like best. I love you, but not that way. <laughs> I just did that by grunting, moving my bunch of these tissues around. This is, Leonardo da Vinci writes this, and uh, da Vinci famously uh, scorned uh, other arts, which by painting is by far the biggest. And uh, in, his, in his journals, <laughs> Oh, somebody has a mic on. So they have the mic. 
<laughs> you know, Brooke, I wonder if you might ask the person who's got the mic, turn the mic on. You said, no, 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 when you said that that person is going to get your Oh, yeah. I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm suddenly blacking on the actors in the What's the music? In one of those movies, he goes to men's room. <laughs> Sounds insane. <laughs> da Vinci writes about speech. This is just to amplify what I just said. Consider well how by the movement of the tongue, with the help of the lips and teeth, the pronunciation of all the names of things is known to us, and how the simple and compound words of a language reach our ears by means of this instrument, and how these if there were a name for all the effects of nature, all the effects of nature, it would approach infinity, together with the countless things which are in action and in the power of nature. And these, man does not express in one language only, but in a great number. And each of those languages also tend to an infinity, because they vary continually from century to century, in time, and from one country to another, in space through the intermingling of the people who by wars and other mischances continually mix with one another. And the same languages are liable to pass into oblivion, and they are mortal like all created things. And if we grant that our world is everlasting, we shall say that these languages have been and still will be of infinite variety through the infinite centuries which constitute infinite times. So that this code that we produce as our body, it's infinitely various. And this is not the case, Da Vinci of all people says, this is not the case with any other sense. For these are concerned only with such things as nature continually produces. And the ordinary shapes of things created by nature do not change, as from time to time do the things created by man, who is nature's greatest Czesław Miłosz, in his one of the Nobel Prize winning Polish poet, uh, Czesław, in his uh, terrific memoir, Made of Realm, a kind of a great book, talks about how during the Nazi occupation, during the Nazi occupation, the most timid Pole, the person most fearful, And he tells about you know, seeing a couple walk with a baby carriage, and three people quite arbitrarily stopping and pointing to the guy who gets in the car and he's gone. Not, it wasn't Jew hunting or red hunting or anything, just their power. The most timid, fearful of us would demonstrate some resistance to the Nazi occupation by having a poem in Polish somewhere in that person. It might be just a nature poem, it could be about anything at all, but it was in the Polish language. And it was a kind of a minimum form of resistance. And he does relate that to the nature of the art, the nature of language, which though we mostly think about language as something that's on a monitor or on a page, the very word language means tongueage, tongue work. It is in its essence, in its origin, and in our evolution, a phenomenon of the body, along with torture. These both are human inventions. They betray our tremendous ingenuity, and they involve the fact that we are animals, and we also have the capacity to invent and create and reason. Uh, in that passage where he talks about the poem as the minimal resistance, he also talks about how hard it is to make a barrier that will prevent words from getting around. He talks about his activity in the underground media of Poland during the Nazi occupation. And this is 
where I start to think about the relation between our concerns and the concerns of pain and people who are jailed as terrorists because they're telling the truth in Ethiopia or Turkey. Uh, Cheswab is often very funny in his memoirs of the uh, occupation. And uh, I'll read a passage. Uh, we haven't talked so far today, and I regret that I have to leave after this talk. We haven't talked about uh, piracy and uh, all kinds of uh, knockoff shops. Uh, I went to a conference on this subject where uh, I learned that uh, long before Hollywood movies are released in Hollywood, you can go to an African street market in almost any African city and uh, buy it, buy the movie. Because within days of the final uh, uh, edit, somebody has sold it to somebody in LA and it quickly gets to a place that you literally can up to uh, where they have a little shop that produces them and, and you can buy it for $5 in the street market. It may not be released for many months. And uh, Cheswap gives a wonderful portrait of a pirate. It just reminded me of the people who were actually stealing stuff. Um, and here, I spend my time on books and papers. There's also The Firm, capital F, an institution too colorful to pass up here, mainly because of its founder. We studied together. He was a tall, anemic youth we all underestimated. Uh, he's son of a miner from Silesia. He had a definite leftist bent, but at the same time was extremely pious. I roomed with him for a while in the student dormitory. I always remembered him as a man kneeling at his bedside, hands folded, engrossed in either mourning or even prayers. I was even then puzzled by his mysterious ability to combine contemplation and action. Valued as an organizer and a strategist, he performed various functions in the leftist liberal bloc. No one, however, could have foreseen his later metamorphosis into a traitor worthy of the Wild West. He founded the firm in Vilno during the fall of 1941, while the German army trudged toward the Volga. In a few months, his profits soared from nothing to millions. And soon, the firm had two branches, one in Minsk, the capital of Belarusia, and the other in Warsaw, granted proper Nazi authorization on the ground of being, quote, useful for the army. The outfit was supplied with all sorts of passes and permits, and allegedly traded in goods. In fact, it dealt mainly in the black market purchase and sale of currency. As a financial power, the firm secured privileges for itself from the Germans through bribery, paying on a regular bonus to a few paid on a regular bonus to a few dignitaries. It also maintained its own workshop for making false documents and ran an effective rescue operation for those threatened with arrest, especially Jews, many of whom owe their lives to it. The firm often transported them, carefully packaged, from city to city. Was W a merchant conqueror? a politician, or an apostle of love of one's neighbor. It would be impossible to separate those three qualities of his. This man, his main interest, publishing. <laughs> and he, after the war, he was already prepared. But just as at the time, they were dealing in copyrights and, and uh, selling uh, books to one another and commissioning books. It seemed uh, theoretical. It was like playing a Monopoly game. Then after the war, the same character who was dealing in currency and Jews and so forth uh, becomes an important figure in the Polish uh, publishing industry. I'm shy of trying to draw too explicit a line between human rights and uh, imprisoned publishers and writers and uh, the plight of County Cullen. I think there is a line, and it's worth thinking about that the suppression of Cohen's poem and the suppression of the video almost makes you think the term terrorist is appropriate. Because there's something fearsome, ultimately, about language. Authority is right to be afraid of it. And uh, if the Polish poem can embody resistance, and if this medium is so subversive and penetrating that it's not dependent upon 
broadcasting towers or printing presses. It's on an individual scale. It's on a human scale. Somebody memorizes it, and it's in the old Bradbury science fiction novel, Fahrenheit 451, where people embody books. They have them by heart. Uh, the corporeality and intimacy of the medium makes it related to human rights and the dignity in a phrase of the individual. Um, rather than try to draw that line any more explicitly than I already have, I am enclosed by reading a poem by Czesław Miłosz. Uh, I worked with Czesław on uh, Polish versions of his, uh, English versions of his poems. I always said that Bob Hass and I should not be called translators it says in the book translated by neither Bob nor I know a lick of Polish. Uh, I always say it should say consultants in English idiom and cadences. <laughs> Robert Pinsky and Robert Pass. So I will close with uh, Czesław Miłosz's poem, Incantation. And it is important to say that uh, the poem is entitled Incantation. This is not a description of the world as uh, Czesław uh, it thinks it is at the moment, but it's the word as a potentially, or in some Catholic but tonic way, is what he is trying to say in the beginning. Incantation. Human reason is beautiful and invincible. No bars, no barbed wire, no pulping of books, no sentence of banishment can prevail against it. It establishes the universal ideas in language and guides our hand so we write truth and justice with capital letters, lie and oppression with small. It puts what should be above things as they are. It is an enemy of despair and a friend of hope. It does not know Jew from Greek or slave from master, giving us the estate of the world to manage. It saves austere and transparent phrases from the filthy discord of tortured words. It says that everything is new under the sun, opens the congealed fist of the past. Beautiful and very young are philosophia and poetry, her ally in the service of the good. As late as yesterday, nature celebrated their birth. The news was brought to the mountains by a unicorn and an echo. Their friendship will be glorious. Their time has no limit. Their enemies have delivered themselves to destruction.
But there is a connection, and it is worth thinking about. And I can't claim that I came from the one flash of inspiration. It's partly temporal. This happened to me two nights ago. That uh, I saw this guy, step, the Turkish guy, step to him, step to the prize. And his the quotation from him, uh, his acceptance letter he sent was, I'm not an activist, I'm just a publisher. Again, in relation to the word publicized and public, it's rather beautiful. And he isn't, he's, it's not that he's party pre or something. So he, he, he needed to publish these books about the Armenian genocide, the Kurds, the Jews, uh, and uh, it made him a terrorist. And as I said at the end of the talk, in some ways, it's an appropriate term. So you mentioned that um, maybe 20 years after your death, you'd want all of your work to be in the public domain. Do you feel like you're unique in this? Do you feel like you... Uh, no, no. I have brought this up with groups of writers. I'm, I'm sorry to jump on your question, Jerm. Uh, am I unique in this? I, no, I don't know uh, many writers. I know some people, uh, I know musicians who sell kajillions of copies of their work. and. Uh, I know a fiction writer or two. I was going to say, I don't know popular novelists. I would venture to say, and Dave defends it, and Susan Tishy can confirm this or not, I'd venture to say it's, it's in the high 90s of percent of writers who say, sure, 20 years after my death, if anybody's still interested in what I did, give it to them. I don't need, uh, I'm grateful to Forrest Strauss and Drew, my publisher, and to Norman. I'm happy then to make money now and for 20 years after Robert's interred, then let them publish somebody new. Do something and let them publish my grandchildren. Enough is enough. So I don't think, I think I'm far from unique in that. I think we'd be close to universal, not only amongst writers, but among artists. Ask Bruce Springsteen what he wants to have. Who does he want to make money for his work after he dies? I don't think the answer would be so different. My Uh, and the propagandists for Disney, I referred to earlier as the evil mouse, <laughs> say, oh, so you always use the word the artist, evil mouse, so we must protect the artist. <laughs> That's actually, uh, I'm Harold Thumb, also the public knowledge, by the way, um, uh, and I can't resist saying huge fan, um, but uh, um, that actually does segue to, to, the, to the one thing I did want to ask, which is we often hear about how the, uh, uh, you know, the strong copyright is the thing that is you know, what artists need and what artists want. And again, there are certainly plenty of artists who will say that they are very much about wanting to uh, you know, control their work and have their work. But, but I just wanted to press, I mean, the, the, the the presentation here, you know, granted we're a very receptive audience, but it's just so amazingly powerful. Um, and you say you've talked to other artists. Is it possible for other poets, other artists, to step forward in a collective way to rebut uh, these arguments about copyright uh, maximalism to celebrate the you know, importance of fair use uh, and the, you know, the limitations uh, and exceptions uh, uh, of copyright in some sort of you know, more organized public way. I, it probably, as I said, I hate meetings. Um, <laughs> so somebody might do that. Um, you guys might consider having your attorneys draw up the uh, oil plate. I can fill on the number of years after my death I want this in public domain. Um, there's a term literary executor that people think has a lot of meaning, has no meaning. Uh, your copyrights, like your car and your bank account and your real estate, goes to your heirs. It's property. Uh, I don't want to neglect artists altogether. The Library of Congress had a conference on this subject years ago, and there was an African musician there in African garb, and he had a real complaint the other side of this. His work that he does, playing traditional instruments, traditional music and singing, 
uh, his income came from public performances of these. And people were making recordings of them, at live recordings, and selling them on CD. And uh, now, so since then, they probably post them. And he, his income is being hurt by that. So it's not that without exception everything must be distributed. Do I want you to take a poem of mine and rewrite it and change a few things and post it on the web? No. You know, there are limits. But I think a good place to start is with this absurd, I, if I had to wait for, I think it's 75 years after County Cullen's death, I would be dead for sure <laughs> before I could see this video posted. That's why I'm so grateful to, to Sherman and to, to Jennifer. The video is up there. I had despaired, I had about given up. Obviously I hadn't given up, and I said, look, if you want me to sit on a committee, uh, everybody has to see this thing, because I have a uh, feeling uh, about the issue. And I think there are probably things your organization could do to uh, cap the feelings of writers and to channel them in some way. And my idea about the uh, uh, will, the boilerplate thing for your will may not be the right way to do it, but uh, I'm pretty confident about this. Uh, from uh, the most uh, sort of refined, you know, the equivalent of the poet who makes a very special artisan goat cheese to the, somebody who produces film. Uh, from Bruce Springsteen to, you know, Louise Click. People would say, yeah, I, mean, I, I want my work to be respected, I want to get credit for it, if I can make a little money from it, or a lot of money from it, good. But after I die, it should be, the people who love it should have a right to it.